Chapter 10 Uncle Joe got a boo boo. Daddy, I had a dream. Sunrise told him the next morning when Harry, quite frantically, was dressing her, being late, it is by lack of sleep. Did you? he asked, absent minded, taking all he needed from the wardrobe. What did you dream about? The previous night, dinner had been very pleasant. He got back in a mood more suitable for company. Sunrise had completely overcome her tantrum, allowing cheerfully Victoire to feed her what only half an hour before was the food of evil, and her and Ginny were in a full rant about the oncoming wedding, exchanging with an indefatigable enthusiasm all the details over and over. It was astounding for Harry how long a conversation of that kind could stretch on. He felt to have it discussed thoroughly and concluded in ten minutes, but it wasn't the same for them. New particulars and considerations were continuously pulled out. What do you think of it? He asked Ted, once in the living room, leaving them to chat in the kitchen with the raptor sunrise who was following the conversation attentively as if very much interested in the arrangement of serviette on the table, so whatever they were talking about. They only just met. He continued dropping on the sofa while Ted was seating himself on the windowsill. Ted tipped his head on one side, bullying me over. I guess. But it's also true that Luna has got inside. Does she? Harry asked, skeptical. It seems living in a different world to me. Ted chuckled. I'd call it inside. She sees things differently and more clearly, I think. Harry frowned, unconvinced. If you say so, it doesn't take away the fact that the guy is in his twenties. He pointed out, getting the newspaper from the coffee table and opening on the sports section. Have a Mary Luna, Ted said matter of fact, making Harry startle. What? He blurted out, dropping the newspaper straight away. Ted smeared seeing his reaction. I had a very big crush on her since I was 14, he admitted coyly, a leg dangling from the windowsill. Are you taking the piece? Harry asked suspiciously. Ted laughed. Nope. If I wouldn't have fell in love with Victoire, I guess sooner or later I would have tried to get off with her. Harry was speechless. He glared at Ted, who was quite suddenly looking outside. You are actually taking the piece. He boomed down funded, leaving the sofa to go to sit in front of him on the windowsill. I promise you I'm not, he assured him his lips buckling into a grin. How come I never knew anything about it? Ted shrugged. You wouldn't have taken me seriously. Of course I wouldn't bloody have. She's 16 years older than you. Ted asked an eyebrow. Only two more than her husband to be. Harry wouldn't be able to reply anything to this affirmation. They had talked until late. And as a result, Harry hadn't managed to wake up at the sound of the first alarm to go to run. Not even at the second, and not at the third. At eight o'clock, Ginny had pitilessly wrenched away from his grasp the duvet in the freezing morning air and switched on the light, giving him the boost. As a result, he was beyond late. Ginny was preparing breakfast for sunrise while he was trying desperately to make her wear underwear, socks, trousers and jumper all in the proper places while she was chatting gaily, notwithstanding the gravity of the lateness. I dreamt Uncle Joe, she chirped, caressing her teddy. Really? He said, scurrying about the room to find the brush that seemed disappeared into thin air. Yes, he got a boo-boo. Gigi. He asked, having located the brush between the bed folding and the tanky and curls. Yes, he's playing. He was playing, sweetie? Harry corrected her. Yes, he was playing, she repeated. And there is a boo! She ooted, whitening her arms, making her teddy fly on the bed. And look, and he got a boo-boo! Retrieving her teddy. That's too bad. Harry said lightly, finishing off his battle against her hair. Now we must go to mummy, he piped out, taking her 
and hurrying in the kitchen, realizing only at the moment that, despite sunrise was more or less ready, he was still in, in his underwear. He spent the whole morning out in active research of anything that could direct them to find the inferi guy. They investigated in strange disappearances of people like of corpses. A very unpleasant task, especially corpses-wise. They visited Muggles' obituary and hospitals, they interrogated Muggles with and without magic, but they didn't advance much in the research. Either the guy had stopped his activity, or he was doing it very shiftily indeed. By the afternoon, he was back in his office. They had received a strange tip from an informer. He wanted to check it out when Elizabeth strode in his office. Harry, Ginny wants to talk to you. She's waiting at the fire. I think it's urgent. Harry, seeing her steadfast expression, followed her quickly. Ginny never called him at the ministry. She knew he didn't like to be disturbed there, and overall he was often out, especially in those days looking for the guy. She usually would send owls and only if something really important had occurred. Therefore, he was slightly alarmed. When he got there, he closed the door, and Ginny, spotting him, didn't even give him the time to sit. Harry, I'm going to San Mango. George had an accident. What? What happened? I don't know exactly. Mom called me five minutes ago. He was doing one of his experiments and something went wrong. I don't think it's anything too serious because it's him who called her from San Mango, and Mom's clock doesn't say he's in mortal danger or anything. The clock at the barrow was still informing Molly of her children's welfare, and it came handy a few times, like in this occasion. It had been enlarged, despite no Fred appeared on it anymore. There was Harry, and all the spouses of her sons. He was her wishes to include her nieces and nephews too, but unfortunately the maker was deceased, so only Ted and Fleur had managed to be included in it. But Mom was so agitated I couldn't make it out. She's going there she continued compositely, but Harry could detect the struggle in appearing so and didn't escape him the uneasiness of her tone. Okay, I'll join you there, he said resolutely. You don't need to, I'm sure he's all right, she said hurriedly. I'm coming, Jenny, I'll meet you there in ten minutes. You don't have to feel forced to, I can let you know once there. Jenny, for heaven's sake, he retorted unnerved. I don't feel forced to, it's George we are talking about. Harry didn't have many friends, and there were only a handful the people he felt comfortable talking to. George was one of them. Probably because besides Ron the youngest, perhaps because they had been at Hogwarts together, or perhaps because all the time spent with him always cheered his spirit up amazingly. Being one, or all these reasons, Harry was very fond of him, and he considered him a very good friend especially after Ron's and Hermione's departure, when he felt in need of some distraction, it was always in Diagon Alley that his feet conducted him. Therefore, this news worried him well enough, and as he wanted surely to be a sustain to Ginny in a moment when she was clearly in distress, he was in equal misery eager to ascertain that everything was fine. Ginny nodded at his words, clearly relieved, and head popped out of sight. Harry hurried out of the room, leaving instruction to a very worried Elizabeth on where to find him in case of emergency, and was off likewise. People were going back and forth in the busy London street, without deigning of a second glance the empty department that stood forgotten on the pathway. He didn't attract the shopper attention, all busy with chatters, burdened by plastic bags from nearby shops. Nobody looked twice to the minute red-haired woman who was standing in front of it with a sad face. Oh, Harry, she said, as soon as Harry appeared from the corner of a small alley, throwing her arms around his neck. Thank you for coming. I know you are busy. Are you kidding? Of course I'd come. He reassured her, caressing her head. Do you know anything new? She shook her head, loosening up from the embrace. I just got here. Let's get inside then he said, pushing her gently close to the shop's window. San Mangles was full of people at that hour, some waiting listlessly on chairs in reception, some working hurriedly, some lining up at the counter. 
the first one to spot him was an elderly man sitting just in front of the entrance. Harry glimpsed him while he was gaping and nudging the old lady on his side. He realized straight away to have made a mistake. In the alarm of the moment, he hadn't thought to disguise his appearance not even slightly, and that always guaranteed being slowed on anything he planned to do. When she raised her eyes on him, he was already passing by swiftly, trying to avoid their gaze. He walked briskly to the counter, keeping Ginny by the hand, hoping to avoid being harassed moving quickly. But there was a queue to line up to, and he was obliged to stop, giving time to all the wizards and witches in the room to realize Harry Potter was there. By the time he approached the line, the whispering that accompanied every of his appearance in the magical community had already started. Some were craning their neck from the plastic chairs to have a better look, and he was expecting any second somebody approaching, and wasn't sure to have the forbearance to be polite. He had only seconds to build it up. The man standing in front of him in line, hearing the steady buzz and seeing people staring behind him, turned. Seeing Harry started visibly. Harry Potter! He murmured, widening his eyes. Harry had to master himself a great deal not to snap. He only muttered a greeting, trying not to scold. Please, allow me to shake your hand, the man said eager, grasping his hand and shaking it vigorously. Such a pleasure to meet you, he continued keying. Yeah, nice to meet you too, whoever you are. You have no idea what this meeting means to me. Me and my wife are so indebted to you. My wife's father had been in Paris by a death theater only a few days before your bringing down of you know who and... While the bloke was getting on with his endless day, a group of people was glowing gathering interested, willing to add their experiences and eager to shake hands. Chini didn't even seem to notice. She was staring at the line impatiently, tapping her foot on the marble floor, clearly concerned about the waiting. I'm glad to have been of any use, Harry tailed off as soon as an opening offered to do so. But we're a bit of an array, if you don't mind. Of course! Now let me detain you and please take my place in line, he said, gesturing him to pass in front of him. You are very kind, but there is no need. He started saying, always reticent in accepting powers because of his name. I insist, the block said. It's the minimum I can do. The other people were all looking at him forgetful of the line, and hearing the exchange, they all suddenly seemed eager for them to overtake. Entreating started to pour. And as he was saying, there is really no need. Ginny, finally acknowledging the mass, interjected with a forced smile. Thank you, very kind. And without any further ado, grasped his arm tightly and dragged him up to the counter, dodging skillfully witches and wizards who tried to stop them, where the Norse was following Harry's approaching with a flash rising in intensity with every step taken by them. We are looking for George Weasley, Jimmy gushed. He was taken here an hour ago. The witch more than the hair, was staring intently at Harry and didn't even pretend to hear her. Ginny and Nell rolled their eyes and waving an hand in front of the witch eyes bellowed, Excuse me! Hearing finally a voice, the witch flinched visibly. Uh, yes, of course! She gabbled, starting to riffle clumsily between her papers and, finding the right one, read mechanically. George Weasley, accident by improper use of magical instrument, ground floor, fourth corridor on your left, fourth door on the right. Having said that much, the witch turned her gaze on Harry again, a stretching quill, and what clearly was an admission paper, stammered with a sweeper voice. Would you mind sign? Ginny didn't even allow her to finish. She tightened her grasp on Harry's arm and dragged him away, muttering furiously under her breath something that sounded very much like, next time you stay in the office. They walked quickly toward the corridor, but Harry, spotting a familiar silhouette crouched on a chair, lurching in his trap, making Ginny almost stumble over. 
It's Jude, he exclaimed as an explanation. Who's Jude? Ginny asked in patience, looking toward the corridor they had to take. George Sell assistant, he, he said quickly, rumbling over her with Ginny on his tray. The girl was whining piteously in an armchair, her nose red and swollen, her hair all disheveled. Jude, what's happened? Did you see him? Harry asked, stooping on her. She raised her eyes, brimmed with tears. Harry, she wailed. There was an accident. Something exploded. I had to go for a healer. She succeeded in saying before a fresh pouring down of sobs shook her shoulders and stopped her armchair. He and Ginny exchanged a preoccupied glance, but one of the two voiced fear not to increase each other for boarding. Okay, okay, now calm down, Harry said reassuringly, stroking Jude's hair. I'm sure it's fine. We're going there. Come with us. He nudged her in standing up, and with Ginny sustained, who was getting more worried by the minute, they looked for the right door. The first glimpse they had of him revealed their fears, totally unfounded. George was sitting up against the pillow with a very annoyed expression, while Molly was combing his hair with solicitude. Mom, it's fine, they heard him complain, trying to shake her off. No, it's not fine, dear. You're a dreadful mess. Molly told him back stem. Now keep still. Georgie! Jude bellowed as soon as he saw him, lunging toward the bed, thrusting her arms around his neck with such energy that she knocked off Molly's comb. A new vigorous sopping gushed from her. George, who's this girl? Molly asked aghast, looking in disbelief at Jude who had hid her face in George's neck. Ah, uh, my says girl. He acknowledged, and spotting Harry and Ginny, smiled happy to have a di diversion from Molly, who was looking thundering. Your sales girl, George? She was asking disapprovingly. All right, guys, he asked, patting Jude's hair, revealing two heavily bandaged hands. I'm fine, Jude, come on, he murmured close to Jude's hair, and sensing the perforating glare coming from Molly, he felt compelled to explain himself. Mom, it's not as you think. She's married. She is married, George? Molly hissed, making George wince uneasy. Hey, Ginny greeted him, going to the other side of the bed that was Jude free to peck him. What happened? How are you? She asked concerned, eyeing Jude suspiciously. Yeah, we got it right, all right, Harry said, taking a chair and dropping it. How are you? George raised his two hands puffy with bandages. Fact impaired, he said. He was playing with some dangerous stuff or other as usual, Molly affirmed, crossing her arms on her bosom, her eyes fixed on Jude, who was snuggled up, still moaning on George's side. I wasn't playing, mother, George bellowed offended. It's work! And I wanted to my be that the objects weren't exactly on the right side of the law, he added weathering. The purpose was worth the, the trouble, he concluded with conviction. What were you working on? Harry asked, looking about the room. George was the only person in it. The room was small, just one bed. The only window was given on a very well-kept garden that couldn't possibly be real considering the jammed burrow some mango was situated. Besides the bed, there was only a bedside table and two chairs. Everything spotless. Actually, it was a magic polishing. If you rub it on your broom, it makes the broom and the owner invisible for a limited time, he said primly, still caressing up some mind as Jude's hair. But that's brilliant, Harry exclaimed, eager, sitting up suddenly very attentive. I know, right? George grinned smug. I could have arrived during daytime without worry. Exactly. The market is gonna be huge. I'm adding only a little flow around the tail. You know, the fireballs use that hay. Which, by the way, I find totally unsuitable for a broom of that kind. He continued with a frown. Harry was nodding, totally immersed in the technical. I know, I know. It works fine in speed, but if you want to slalom a bit, 
or in the elbow turn, it can get a bit tricky, he said, tilting his head and mimicking the turn in question with his hands. Totally agree. And one more, it's just not compatible with my polishing. I must find... Foy, Jim interjected, interrupting the flow of their excited words. We'll talk about it later. What happened, George? What about your hands? He stopped in his track. My hands? He asked, looking at them, as if only at that moment realizing they were out of use. Nothing, really. There had been a reaction between two ingredients I didn't exactly foresee, and the whole thing exploded in my hands. The healer gave me a bomb to put on it twice a day, and it should be fine in no time. I must keep the bandage on, though. It's infectious, apparently, he said, staring concernedly at his hands. I can take them off only for the bomb. Just when Molly was saying mollify, you should come at the barrel. Jude, who at that point had calmed down and was mopping her eyes with her handkerchief, suggested sniffing, I can help you out. Gregory is out of town until Wednesday. The scout returned in full form, but Jude was barely registering her present, concentrated on George, eyes still suffused with tears. Um, right, we'll see. I don't want to trouble you, he said, smiling uneasy, with a flickering glance to Molly, who was livid, observing careful each and every of their moves. It's not a problem, Georgie. My toothbrush is already there. I just need to grasp a few things, she said, pecking his lips, which instantly made both Jimmy and Molly lurch to attention. I'll go now. I've got the keys in my bag. I'll wait for you there. Jimmy and Molly followed her out the room, hook like. Who is she, George? Molly asked threateningly as soon as she was out of sight. I told you, my cell assistant, he replied with a small voice, backing against the pillow. I'm not an expert, but I don't think cell assistants have usually the keys of their boss flat, not even the toothbrush at their place she said with ashes. How old is she? Jimmy asked in exactly the same posture as Molly and exactly the same shade of lividness. I don't think it's anybody bees. George tried boldly to retort. How old? Jimmy shouted, covering his words. Twenty-nine! He gushed. Is she married? Who's Gregory? Molly got close to the bed towering on him, shoulder and by Ginny. Okay, right, Harry says, standing up, sensing in the air the storm and wanting to be out of the room before it hit. I see you are very well and all, he said brightly to George. George shot him a terrified look. Are you going? Yep, exactly, mustache, sorry, he gabbled, backing quickly Ginny, who didn't even notice or taken by incinerating George with her glare. You are in good hands, anyway. Yes, and you are a... George? Molly admonished, divining that the next word couldn't be a flattering one. Harry sniggered. See ya, and say hello to Jude. He said with a smear, getting back the word George hadn't been able to pronounce in the previous sentence, accompanied by a friendly grin. George! Molly warned him, if I hear that again... Mom, for God's sake, I'm 40. I think I am the right you. You didn't have any right whatsoever, and you never will until I'm your mother. I don't want to hear you using that kind of language in front of me again, and you will get rid of the girl immediately as soon as you're back home. Harry was getting out of the room by then, but he still heard George replying witty. Why should I do that? She does her job so well. The echo of Molly's shout reverberated in the wall corridor. Chapter 11 Sunrise Stream It was only at dinner time, when chatting with Ginny, that he was reminded about Sunrise Stream. So then he admitted he's taking to bed that silly girl, and Mum lost the plot completely. And honestly, I quite agree with her. She's so young. She was saying eager, all taken by her tail while picking her salad energetically with a fork. You didn't have a problem with Luna marrying a twentish guy? Harry interjected. 
these yogurt steak. Only occasionally I reminded the sunrise to eat. Jenny stopped in her truck, taken aback, but she recovered pretty fast. It's different. Sean doesn't work for her, she said, pouring herself a glass of water and setting down the jug a bit too firmly as to underline her point. Doesn't she help her out in writing that column for the quibbler on the lives led by muggles? Harry asked, rising to innocent eyes on her. Jenny found herself speechless again, but as before, she recovered soon. He does, but she doesn't pay him. He does it for fun, she retorted challenging. You are actually saying that if George stopped paying her, would you be fine? Harry asked nonchalantly, returning his attention on his plate. No, it wouldn't be fine, she spat virulently. She was starting to be short of accusation when finally remembered one of the reasons why the relation Jude George was on trial, and she blurted out, she's already married. It didn't seem your first preoccupation, Harry said, knowing he was pushing it, but unable to stop. It actually is. Ginny said, dropping her fork and glaring at him. Did you know about it? Why didn't you tell me? Harry paused eating, and Archie's eyebrow looking up. What well, should have said it properly? Ginny, George is having an affair with his married whippersnapper cell assistant? She nodded energetically. Yes, exactly that, she grunted. It's none of my business who is taken to bed, and it shouldn't be your either. It was a very bold answer, and as soon as he uttered it, he knew to have pushed his luck a bit too far. But it was too late to take it back. Ginny was so purple and ferocious that Harry considered seriously to grab sunrise and run outside to be far from the line of fire. But as she inflated with wrath menacing the worst outburst ever had, after a second of consideration, she deflated returning to her lovely pinkish tint. She took back her fork, mulling it over. Actually, you might be right, and she seemed actually very worried for him, she only added, retrieving her eating. Harry, still on the lookout, watched her carefully, fearing an act, but not seeing any other dangerous sign, retrieved his fork, and only giving her a watchful glimpse or two, he returned to his steak. They were silent for a few moments, but he could perceive Ginny's stove still fixed on the subject. Do you think he's in love with her? Harry was taken aback by the question. He didn't answer straight away. You must have seen them together, she added, cutting down for sunrise a piece of veggie to dip for her. He actually never gave it a thought. He tried to bring his mind to the moment spent in their company and reflected on it. George had never admitted anything of the kind, which wasn't surprising anyway, and talked always lightly of her when they were alone, but he had noticed how caring he was in her regards, those small gestures, kisses and cuddles. He stepped there without even realizing it, exactly the same he poured on Ginny every day. He reflected as well about what George always affirmed about her involvement in existence under his point of view, but somehow it clashed with Jude's behaviour that day. Harry didn't know if he was in love or not, but she might actually be. He promised himself to give a hint to George in that direction the next time. I don't know, he only answered to Ginny, having finished his steak and trying, without being noticed, to push away his plate with all the veggies still untouched. Hit the veggies too! Ginny ordered Stan, spotting his niche. Harry pulled back his plate begrudgingly. Well, I hope not, she said soon after with a sigh. Why? Harry asked, puzzled. It didn't seem such a bad notion to see George finally in love. He never had a steady partner, only pointless affairs, where he was usually the third of some kind that couldn't for whatever reason evolve in anything serious. Perhaps Harry didn't actually picture him in a family or as a father, but he was sure that a good strong love could have benefited him. 
Ginny raised an eyebrow and looked at him meaningfully. Harry, she's married, she said, pointing out the obvious that had totally escaped Harry, standing up to take her empty plate to the sink. That was indeed the problem. I lost hope to see George married, honestly, she added alternatively, returning to her chair. Sunrise, hearing what Ginny had just said and waving her spoon in the air, hooted, Joe got the boo boo. Yes, sweetheart, she said sweetly, taking an empty plate from under her. Uncle George got the boo boo, but he's well now. Those words caused Harry a suddenly remember about the morning. He shot a bewildered look at Sunrise, who was playing with her spoon uncertainly, and felt a creep drive along his spine. She couldn't know. That hadn't even happened yet. A coincidence? A second coincidence? The hypothesis of coincidence was starting to be far-fetched. Although, he was reticent in acknowledging any other theory far more difficult to accept. But as Ginny was in a chatting mood that required his undivided attention, he tried to put the matter aside, though finding his mind hardly able to set itself on anything else. Uneasiness growing, he offered himself to put Sunrise to bed after dinner, to try to explore the matter a bit more in depth. Here you go, sweetheart, he said to Sunrise, folding the blanket around her body and resting her teddy close to her, who clenched straight away, pulling it closer. His mother had back her hair. Sweetie, do you remember about the dream of Uncle George Boo Boo? Yes, Daddy, he got a Boo Boo. That's right. Can you tell Daddy what happened? She looked up. He's playing. He was playing, darling. With what? Did you see? She looked at his teddy, unsure. With toys, she replied, wriggling her mouth. What then? Did you say there was a boom? She lighted up. Yes, daddy, big boom! She said, throwing her teddy into the hair and laughing. Finally, Stangelus! She added all serious. If you touch it, you get a boom. Yes, sweetie. Quite right, Harry answered, starting to lose hope to get back something that could help him understand. Did you see anything else? Did you see where he got the boo-boo? She looked at him inquiringly. Therefore, Harry entered in a child modality to see if he could get his answer. Did you get the boo-boo here? He said, smiling and kissing her forehead. She shrilled, delighted, and shook her head. Here? He said, tickling her tummy. He got back an even louder shrill, and she shook her head again. And feeling a foreboding sensation in his stomach, he took her tiny hands and clasped them in his own. Here, Sunrise, still laughing, shifted an affirmative, making Harry lurch. Are you sure, sweetie? Yes, Daddy! She nodded, eager, clapping her hands. Harry was trying to make out the whole thing. But it was difficult, as Sunrise, staring at her hands and then clapping them together, had started to hoot excitedly. Blue! Blue Daddy! She said, waving them under his nose. Like the sea! Yes, sweetie, you are right. The sea is indeed blue. He muttered pensively, deciding at the moment that the time had come to share his uneasiness with Ginny. She was in the kitchen. She was in the kitchen, clearing the table. It had taken Harry some time to make Sunrise fall asleep, half an hour off in turn, good night kisses, chats, a bad night story, and in desperation, a steady entreating to manage. Being winter time, the kitchen was cosily only dimly lighted. The fire was roaring in the fireplace, and that and the small lamp were the only sources of light. Harry suggested washing dishes together, as he wanted very much to talk to her. He didn't know where to start, as he didn't know what to think. The day had of the incredible, and he was reticent in acknowledging it aloud. But washing dishes was an activity that always suited his mind, making it easier for him to ponder and talk about important matters. 
most of the crucial decisions of their life had been made in that kitchen washing dishes, as well as most the confidence made to her. Harry's mind was loaded most of the time. That's why he tended to be quite silent and not very communicative, contenting to listen to others speaking, usually Ginny and the Albus one at home. That's why washing dishes was such an important time to spend with Ginny. They were the only moments in which he was relaxed enough to be open. Weren't many the activities that had that power over him, and each of them was dedicated to a member of his family. Washing dishes with Ginny, running with James, and flying with Albus. Siri had a dream yesterday, he announced. Did she? Ginny asked, filling the sink with soapy water. Yes, and I don't know what to make of it. And taking the first plate to rinse, he told her the gist of it. She listened attentively, passing dish after dish to Harry after I'd be rubbed it clean. Well, Harry, it doesn't seem to me anything extraordinary, she announced at the end. She told you a silly dream, and you, knowing what happened, made it fit. She told me that George hurt himself, Ginny, he pointed out, before it even happened. Ginny didn't seem so impressed. She's having nightmares any other day. You get hurt, I get hurt, everybody seems to get hurt, and we are all here alive and well. But this was different, Harry insisted. She wasn't scared and there were too many particulars matching, and it's not the only time that happened. So then he proceeded, telling her of the Luna's dream. Again, she wasn't impressed at all. It was just another silly dream. Luna is dressed in yellow basically a day yes and a day yes. I actually seldomly have seen her without something yellow or other, and she brights her hair very often with yellow flowers. And don't forget, the sea's the past summer, sunrise fall in love with the sea. She barely talks about anything else. She paused while Harry was mulling this over. Only the tinkling sound of the plates and cutlery in the scene could be heard for some time. I don't know, I think you are reading more than there is actually in it. Perhaps she was right. Now he had voiced them, they seemed less striking and more silly dreams of a not quite three-year-old child. He didn't press the matter further, a bit quietened by Ginny's word. Probably she was indeed right. He was reading more than there was in it. Chapter 12 Blue like the sea. On Sunday, Ginny insisted to go to Diagon Alley. Harry had worked the whole Saturday and was very much bent on going that day too. However, Ginny had darkened so much when he hinted about the possibility that he felt wiser abandoning the plan straight away. Following his inclination, he would never have chosen Diagon Alley as a day out. The place was great, and it was always interesting to browse in quality Quidditch supplier, but they always had to modify their appearance to go. And only that took most of the morning, giving them only a limited amount of time for shopping. However, Ginny was adamant. She wanted to get a watch for James and a dress for the wedding. Sunrise was the force to be subjected to the changes. He had shortened and lightened her hair and changed her eyes color. She had been dressed in some of old Albus clothes and for that reason she looked very much like a little boy. She seemed vastly pleased by this boyish attire and very smug in wearing his older brother's clothes. Harry, personally, much preferred her in girlish outfits but more often than not, they were spurned mercilessly from sunrise, who didn't seem too inclined on frills and pink, so much for her disappointment. Ginny was stunning. Despite she had asked for a sober look, no matter how hard Harry tried, couldn't make her less than shining. She had long auburn hair full of waves that fell gently on her beautiful back and big yellowish eyes. This is too showy, Harry! 
she exclaimed when it was done. But as it was already late, much to Harry's satisfaction, she had no choice but to keep it. Harry, in the never failing wish to be an anybody, tried for the most anonymous of looks in his chore, but being tall was always a difficult enterprise. So transformed, they met for Diagon Alley. They passed unnoticed in the crowded leaky cauldron, and even more unnoticed in the busy alley. The weather being acceptable, it was full of families strolling lazily. Couples sitting at a cafe, group of chattering witches charged with colorful shopping bags. Where shall we go first? We need... Jimmy was asking purposely as soon as the brick wall sealed back behind them. Quality Quidditch supplier! He tailed her off, all in one breath, walking swiftly in that direction, not giving her the chance to reply back. Knowing Jimmy, if he'd allow her to go for the dress first, the whole thing was going to take so long that there wouldn't have been time for anything else. And it was such a bore that rendered him stupid as a log for the whole fitting session while their time could have been spent much more pleasantly talking about brooms. The good thing about having a wife who worked in the field was that she could sustain a satisfying conversation about brooms as Seth, unlike all the other women he knew. He had always kind of pitied Ron, who with her mind missed this great source of happiness. She could discuss at length features and very often had given him excellent advice. On the downside, discussing and purchasing for the team so often that when with Harry, she seldom matched his enthusiasm and more often than not wished to be out of it as soon as possible. That day was no exception while he was perusing carefully the new models groping for opinions. She was tapping the floor with her foot impatiently, while Sunrise, very much charmed by the colors and the, and the broom's shine, was trying to touch whatever met her gaze in a non-stop of chapters and questions. Harry, can we go? She said, looking at her watch not even ten minutes later. We have tons of place to visit, and the spells won't last forever. Harry groaned annoyed, looking up from a new nimbus he was inspecting, in consideration if worthwhile to purchase. We just got inside. You don't need a new broom, Ginny admonished him, reading his mind. Despite being very aware it was so, he replied, his attention captured completely by the broom. Do you hear me complaining when you buy new clothes? I need to dig every morning amid feet and feet of fabric to find one of my t-shirts, not to mention shoes. Ginny frowned. It's different. She muttered darkly. I don't think so. We both buy things we rarely have the chance to use. He said, balancing the broom on two fingers. What do you think of this one? She sighed and answered as if reading a book. If all you are looking for is speed, it's not great. Adapted for a beater, but definitely not for a seeker. It doesn't respond well to that kind of game. We could get it for James, he said absentmindedly, determined to buy something or other. He doesn't need a new broom either. You got him one last year, remember? And there was no reason since he didn't become a prefect. She added, puckering her lips. She had been greatly disappointed by it, and for a long time couldn't explain it to herself, as he had top marks in most of the subjects. Harry, with a mind not hazed by maternal love, could be a bit more objective on his son assets, like on his flows. He had indeed top marks, but he was so disrespectful of rules and rebellious that he hadn't considered it possible not even for a minute. It would have been like freeing the tiger from the cage. Since Lily's death, the situation had deteriorated fast, and he was keeping a steady and ferocious by her side correspondence with McGonagall with threats of expulsion every line. As a result, he hadn't been neither surprised nor disappointed for it. Although it wasn't that important for him as it seemed to be for Ginny, that has set her heart on it since James' 11th birthday. 
Uller Hoop were now reversed on Albus, who, though being sedate and pretty much obedient, was sewing fine enough not to be reprimanded, but no shining marks wise, contenting himself with the minimum effort and, not the leader by nature, was happy to be left in the shadow. Ginny seemed doomed to be disappointed. We don't need the new broom, she added categorically. Harry was putting back the broom grudgingly, when a sudden loud clatter and a tinkling laugh resounded in the shop. In a mess of toy brooms scattered everywhere and two or three pots of polishing smashed, Sunrise was mounting a toy broom she had picked from a basket knocking it over, with a delighted expression on her face. Daddy look, I fly! She was chirping excitingly, floating a foot from the ground. Ginny sprinted toward her scowling, while Harry smirked proudly. I think we might actually do need one, he said, helping her to tidy up while a sail assistant was marching to the spot glowering. Ten minutes and a sharp reprimand later, they were walking in the busy street again. Sunrise, who had obtained a new broom, was following slowly, concentrated on the balance, for some reason imitating the sound of an engine in the meanwhile. Harry, pushing her gently forward with the hand on her back, was channeling in a good mood. If not harassed, he enjoyed having a stroll there very much, the shop to visit many, all in vivacious colours and cheerfully untidy. He forced Ginny to get an ice cream in an endeavour to check her obsession about dieting that time to time tended to rage out of control. They sat on the outside, enjoying the little sun that occasionally made its appearance between the clouds. The ice cream parlour had been reopened soon after the Voldemort bringing down, but a different owner had succeeded to Rian. He hadn't been found again, as all the people disappeared during the Dark Lord ascent to power. Ollivander had been back to business, but being very old and shaken by the dreadful experience in the Malfoy mansion, had taken an apprentice, none on the less than Dean Thomas, who had inherited the business. That was one of the reasons why Harry had always been present with Ginny when Albus and James had needed their force wands, no matter how many hardships he had to confront going in diagonally back when he wasn't changing his look by magic. They stopped for the watch in a tiny shop where clock and watches of disparate shapes, dimension and magical properties were in exposition. Half an hour later, they were still at sea. The counter was covered with at least 15 different models, and the smile on the man behind the counter was starting to be a bit fixed. Ginny was studying each and one of them carefully, as if instead of a watch they were choosing a life-saving device for his eldest son, asking Harry for tons of opinions and not listening to any of his answers. At the end, the choice was reduced to two models, and Harry, to conclude the matter before James' birthday, only a few months away, said firmly, pointing to one of the two, I think we should get this one. Ginny, predictably, chose the other. The last dreaded place to be visited was Madame Maitin. Ginny, who usually wore muggle clothes, for formal events always opted for which and which that wear. Harry, who never chose it if he could avoid it, didn't like it on Ginny either. Why don't you wear the nice muggle dress I got you last year? He asked her while sitting on a stool, with sunrise on his lap outside the fitting room. Because it's white. You don't wear white at a wedding. Her voice came from behind a dark green curtain. But she's gonna wear yellow. Yellow! Sunrise echoed tittering. Reason more! Ginny snapped. And then I want a witch robe. You have hundreds, Harry replied wearily. It was already an hour they were in there, and he had to look, comment, and pretended to be interested in, in more dresses he could count. I want a new one. It's Luna's wedding. This last sentence had become her favorite exclamation to close any remark made on the topic. 
it was said with different intonations depending on the meaning he wanted to convey. Her favorite was the threatening one when he hinted about the possibility of him not going because of work. What do you think about this one? She said, coming out from the pitting room and standing in front of the mirror, smoothening a long blue robe. It's nice, Harry said, bored, while Sunrise was singing a song about colors, pronouncing one correct word out of ten and trying to get Harry to join in. Ginny rolled her eyes irritated. You could at least pretend to be interested. They seem all the same to me, Harry gobbled defensively. Why can't you wear a muggle dress? They suit you better. Because, she answered, all patronizing, it's a formal occasion. It's gonna be on the beach, Harry retorted, and Luna surely is not going to wear one. It's her wedding. I didn't wear it on mine either. Harry didn't reply, trying to remember, and Ginny, seeing his expression, became suspicious straight away. Do you remember my wedding dress, right? Of course I do, he lied, pretending to be offended by the question. What lie underneath was printed indelibly in his mind, but what was covering, he had no clue. How was he done? It was white, and seeing her expression becoming sad and long. She folded her arm forbiddingly, and kind of shiny? She darkened it so much that Harry blurted out, Come on, Ginny, it was twenty years ago. Ginny disappeared again in the pitting room, without a word. He had as well only flashes of memories about the wedding, very small, no man invited, Ron had been his best man. There was Luna, Hermione, or the Weasley, and not many people besides. They had celebrated at the borough, but the particulars were blurred. On the other side, he remembered in detail his first night and the honeymoon that followed. A week far away in a remote island, where only muggles lived. A week in which Ginny never said no to him, not even once. And he had asked a lot. Best week of his life, there was a permanent smile stamped on his face. Ginny popped out again with a lilac one with silvery trimming. What about this one? She asked, checking closely at the trimming. Harry pretended an exaggerated oh. This one definitely it stands out so much you look stunning and a shapeless shape. Never seen anything like it. He boomed. Ginny laughed. You are such a fool, she reprimanded, hitting him on the shoulder. Be serious. What do you think? Mummy the blue, let the see. Sunrise hooted, pointing to the fitting room where the blue one was hanged. I think we have a winner, Harry said, checking his watch. Get the blue, the lilac, or get them all if you wish, but let's get out of here before the spell fades. I want to go to Josh too. At being sunrise, opposite of him, in all her femininities, the chooser, she indeed opted for that one. The shop was, as usual, extremely busy. Children were running back and forth excitedly, jumping from a shelf to another, observing every article studiously, accompanied by parents who struggled to keep pace. The place was so colourful and full of inputs that Sunrise had plunged in a complete silence. Most unusual with her, it was just staring, nose in the air, ecstatically. Jude was serving two witches who had bought an enormous quantity of love potions and were giggling, whispering madly in each other's ears. Harry caught between the jabbering and tittering his name and in a fit of horror was ready to leap behind the closest shelves when he remembered they couldn't recognize him. He hailed a brief of relief while Ginny was calling after them exiting the shop. Harry approached Jude who was tidying up some shelves after the kids' hurricane with a broad smile. Poor I, Jude. She looked at him puzzled for a moment, and then, brightening suddenly, she exclaimed, Harry? Yeah, it's me. Did you recognize my voice? 
Not really your voice. You move in such a particular way. She simpered. Harry decided to ignore the remark. Jude, do you know by any chance where George is? Ginny asked from Harry's side. She looked at her a moment, and then she beamed. You must be Ginny. I'm sorry I didn't introduce myself properly at the hospital while I was so upset. She cooed, rolling her eyes and taking her hand affectionately. George is upstairs, fiddling with something I sincerely hope is not dangerous. She added scowling. I will be happy to see you, though, she concluded gaily. They left her to her job and made for the entrance, while Ginny was sharing with Harry her impression on Jude. She seems nice, after all, she was saying pensively. A bit young, maybe. And paid for her job, Harry said teasingly, taking a disapproval at which Ginny sniggered and nudged him. George welcomed them cordially, eager to show Harry the improvement made on his polishing. His hands were free of bandages and perfectly fine. He offered them a glass of mead, freeing a corner of the table from the ingredients used for his experiment, and gave Sunrise a pygmy puff to keep her busy, the rolled up on her wrist, making her laugh excitedly. You are not using again some classified objects, are you? Ginny asked him, minacious, after he had showed them the fruit of his study. He had managed to make the handle quite invisible, but the hay was still creating him some issues. Of course I am, George replied serious, but I'm more cautious, he added grinning. Ginny seemed about to retort, but changed her mind halfway. Instead, she asked compliant. What was wrong with your hands anyway? I never asked you. He observed pensively his hands that were now their usual pale pink common to all the Weasley family. He slumped against the chair and put his feet on the table, knocking over two or three utensils that cluttered the surface, making Ginny cringe. You know, it was actually an interesting side effect. They were covered with very small and particularly itchy scale of a pure deep blue. Like the sea! Sunrise exclaimed, rising her heads in the air with the pygmy puff still rolled on one of them.